Thank you very much. Now, our third speaker, before we open it up to the floor, is Professor Alan Miller, who started out running a legal aid practice in Castle Milk before he uh, started focusing fully on the human rights agenda. He's the recent past chair of the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership, and uh, he's held various elected position on the, uh, the positions chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, chair of the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions, and he's currently a special envoy, great title, of the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. Would you give him a lovely Edinburgh welcome? <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Penny, and uh, thanks to Shelter for the, the invitation. And it's, it is uh, an honour to be asked to be present on such an occasion. Um, but as I was sitting there listening to the two acts before me, I was thinking, boy, uh, thanks, Shelter, for giving me <laughs> two acts to follow like that. Uh, if I had known the script, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, I may not have been standing here in front of you. Uh, so can the bottom of my heart, can I thank Val and and Karen for uh, two tremendous um, contributions. Um, but let me try and answer them directly in, in what I want to say, because uh, you know, a lot of what both said struck chords with me, and I'm sure it has with all of you. Um, Val, of whom I'm an avid fan and I've read everything she's written, um, didn't let me down. And even though we hadn't talked beforehand about who's going to say what, she did raise towards the end of what she said uh, how do we make housing a human right? Did, would, that, would that lead us somewhere? Um, and I want to answer that. Um, and I want to answer it in a way that, that Karen was saying what is needed these days, putting verbs in sentences, i.e., what do we do to make housing a human right? And also to pick up what Karen said, which I think is the beginning and the end of it all. Every decision, every policy, every law, every daily thing that's done has to be rooted in human dignity. How do we do that practically in Scotland in these times? That's what I want to um, put forward to try my best as a sort of male, middle-aged, cerebral professor coming on a stage after two barnstorming acts like that. So give me a break and, and, and <laughs> let, let me try and do it. Um, so like Karen, I was asked um, by Shelter, can you think of one thing from your life uh, personal and working life, and for me it's the same thing, personal and working life, if you do human rights, um, that's relevant for housing and, and social justice. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, the one thing that has been a thread throughout my working life um, is that housing is a human right. Um, and can I congratulate Shelter? Uh, after 50 years, there is no better way to mark a 50th anniversary than the publication just last month uh, that housing is a human right. Uh, I think this is a watershed uh, moment for shelter, and I congratulate all of you that have done that. So, uh, let me give you three parts of the, the, the chain or the thread on housing and human rights that have been part of my life and, and bringing it right up to the present and trying to answer um, the demands of Val and Karen, which I think reflects all of us. Um, as, um, as Penny was saying, my sort of legal life started in Castle Milk uh, in the 80s and 90s, where for 15 years I ran a, a legal aid practice. And in Castle Milk in those days, um, housing was the issue. Um, and I saw the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. Uh, I saw despair but I saw bucketfuls of resilience amongst the residents in Castle Milk who are determined to make the best of it uh, and improve their lives. The takeaway from 15 years of working in Castle Milk on an everyday basis was housing is central to the well-being and the development of an individual, of a family and of a community. And if we can't get housing right, all the other stuff is going to be problematic. Then, after that, um, I was elected, as Penny was saying, by the Parliament to become the first chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And um, 
it's a, you know, it's quite, it was the first time that the, the Parliament established a commission and they, they elected me chair and said, right, go on with it, you're independent, give us an annual report as to what you're up to. Uh, and you think, right, that's great, you know, what do I do now? Fortunately, I was one of many that um, has been mentored over the years by a good colleague and friend, Mary Robinson, the former Irish president and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so I've had a conversation with Mary. <laughs> Mary, um, what do I do now? Uh, you know, give me some advice. And um, she's never short in giving people advice uh, and challenges. And she said, the first thing you should do, Alan, you might be chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, but look outside Scotland. Um, I said, look, it's taxpayers' money, Mary, you know, junkets, all that. No, it's not that far from Scotland. Go to Belfast and go to a housing estate in North Belfast and you'll learn a lot about what needs to be done in Scotland. And you know, when Mary tells you to do something, it's, it's, it's how high you jump, it's not whether you jump. So I took myself to the Seven Towers housing estate in Belfast. And what I learned there about housing being a human right uh, was about power and about participation. And let, let me unpack that briefly. The Seven Towers housing estate was one of the most deprived in Belfast. Subject to discrimination, uh, it was a, a Catholic Republican housing estate. They still had the old British Army watchtowers on top of some of the high-rise buildings. The housing conditions were atrocious. But something was happening there, and the residents were organizing themselves with a human rights NGO supporting them, but the residents were leading this. And they were empowered by the knowledge that they were given that housing is a human right. There is a, a UN international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights which enshrines the right to adequate housing. The UK has signed up to it, although it hasn't yet given the domestic effect to it that the UN constantly calls on it to do. But the residents thought, oh, you're saying that we've got a right. Um, and we're not just sort of asking for things uh, or the victim of circumstances, but We've actually, we can actually stand up and say, no, we want adequate housing, and it's an international law, and you signed that, and therefore there's an obligation on you to do something about it. And so it, it energized them, it empowered them. And what they then did was Belfast City Council said, right, we're going to do some external cladding on your buildings because we've got a pot of money finally. And the residents said, no, you're not. If there's going to be money finally that can be spent in this community, it's not going to go in external cladding. We live inside the houses, and that's where the money needs to be spent. And we've got a right to housing, and we've got a right to participate in decisions that are going to impact on the enjoyment of our rights. So we will go around the residents, and we will have a, a list. What are the biggest bangs for your buck that would improve your daily lives? Uh, because we've got this resource finally. And it was things like not external cladding of the buildings, but pigeon shit on the landings gets ingested by our kids and they get sick and it's not cleaned up and it's not prevented. Broken glass on the playground means that the kids can't get out to play because no one is able to properly maintain the playgrounds. The lifts break down all the time and if you're a single mum on the 18th floor and no one comes to fix the lift for three, four days, you're stuffed. You know. So these are the things that need to be prioritized. And we know that nothing's going to you know, change overnight. So this is going to be a journey. Um, but we want to measure what progress you make according to indicators that we will devise ourselves about what the impact is in our daily lives and housing. And that's what they did. And I thought, this is, this is terrific. And so uh, as I was chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, I don't know if my, my successor Judith Robertson is here, but um, I, I started it and Judith has carried on. We then worked with a, a housing project in Leith and, and transferred this learning to them because the same conditions, the same problems, um, and the same thing happened. Uh, and now I was talking to, uh, just before we, we came down the stairs, to Claire McGilvery and, and Heather Ford who are over here, who are in the thick of this project in Leith. And I asked him, so what's the plus that came out of this work over a period of about a couple of years and still, still going on? And they said, well, people's health. 
has significantly improved, not just their physical health, but their mental health. And NHS Health Scotland is actually coming to sort of try and understand how housing is a sort of co-determinant of what kind of health you might go on to enjoy. And there's a sense of community. People talk to each other. This monitoring and indicating and reporting is pulling people together um, and there's, there's less anxiety in the community and, and relationships uh, are better. Not perfect, it's a journey, but you can see that power and participation are, are underpinning it. The third thing I'm bringing is up to date um, with my term of office as chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission ended three years ago, and um, so I, I'm, I'm now working with the UN. But then, uh, just after the Brexit referendum, inevitably, um, the First Minister asked me to chair uh, an advisory group on human rights leadership. Um, she wanted concrete recommendations. What are the next steps Scotland should be taking to exercise leadership in human rights in and by Scotland, including in the post-Brexit environment, whatever that looks like? And I was given a year with colleagues to come up with concrete recommendations. And so went around the country talking to as many different kinds of people and organisations and, and prepared and presented recommendations to her on International Human Rights Day, December 10th uh, last year. The central recommendation uh, is that we should take these internationally recognised human rights and bring them into our law, policy and everyday practice, and that includes the right to adequate housing. What difference will that make? What, what, what sort of will that lead to? Well, again, another couple of words um, beginning with P, prioritization and practice. What does that mean? Prioritization, I think um, what will happen is if the right to adequate housing is enshrined in our law, and we know you can have lovely things enshrined in laws, but then down here, it's, it's another world. Um, but it will mean that the policies, progressive housing policies, which you know, the government by and large and the parliament attempt to do, they will be guaranteed, they will be anchored in the governance of the country and what priorities are given, not just in terms of law, but then the policies and the budgetary decision-making priorities that are then just made, you know, what, what allocation of resources should go um, to housing in comparison uh, with others. So housing would become much more prioritized and sort of anchored and how we made decisions at that level. But then at the real ground level, um, the practice would change because what we have said in the, in the recommendations that there should be a new human rights framework in Scotland post-Brexit. It should have at its heart internationally recognized human rights, but they will either stand or fall depending on how they live or breathe in everyday life of people. Um, so the courts can be there as a last resort, but the first resort is, is this going to actually stand up in the decisions made by housing authorities, by local authorities, by the regulators, the inspectors, the adjudicators, etc., because it's there that human rights either stand or fall, and that accountability space on an everyday basis, that has to be strengthened from the, the current uh, unsatisfactory state of affairs where even the rights that do exist in law aren't translated into everyday practice and this publication from Shelter uh, paints that very clearly. Let me conclude um, what's next. Um, we, we made the presentation of these recommendations to the First Minister as I said just a, a couple of months ago. Um, she has publicly supported them. Uh, there was a debate the following week in the Scottish Parliament. There was cross-party support for the, the thrust of the recommendations. And we will see in the next, I don't know, couple of months, um, the First Minister will establish a national task force to take forward these recommendations. So, it could actually happen. Um, I've been round the block often enough and, and put out proposals and, and they sort of float around and then they come back, uh, but this time it looks like they might be sticking because we're in times where there has to be big thinking, there has to be ambition, there has to be a sense of uh, we, we take big steps in these times where there's such uh, uncertainty and, uh, and the plates are shifting. And that's certainly what I found when I was speaking to all kinds of people around the country over the last year. For shelter, what does this mean? 
well, what we said in the recommendations was this new act of the Parliament to enshrine these internationally recognised rights um, has to follow a public participatory process. The public have to lay claim, take ownership of these rights, and also tell the politicians to make them effectively implemented. This has to be put into place. That lesson has to be learned. We can't repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. So shelter has a massive role to make that process honest, to have a reality check on the ambitions and the aspirations of putting these laws uh, on, onto our books. And then finally, the other thing that we learned a lot from the year-long process of, um, sort of gathering evidence and talking to people and shaping recommendations is that human rights leadership is not something to be left to the politicians. They have a role to play. It's a very important role. And if they don't play it, we're all uh, you know, at a disadvantage. Um, but it's not left the politicians. Um, all of you are either, seems to me, looking at the registration list, you're either sort of everyday decision makers of some kind or another, or you're everyday advocates for housing rights in one way or another. So the share of human rights leadership rests very, very firmly uh, on your shoulders if this is going to become operationalized and effectively implemented. It has to become part of the daily practice uh, of all of you. And also, and ultimately, the people themselves, the residents in the houses, the tenants, etc., they're the ones that must become empowered to lay claim and hold to account those, including yourselves, who are making decisions on their behalf. Uh, so they must participate in that process uh, and be empowered, as, as I saw in these housing estates. Let me just finish on um, one quote, which I think uh, maybe is the one thing that ties human rights and, and housing together. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of shelter. This past year has seen the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The key architect uh, of that um, the declaration was Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, one of the things that she wrote about that I think resonates in this context. She said, she posed the question, where do universal human rights begin? And she answered herself saying, they begin in small places, close to home, without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So in that spirit, I would like to open up the discussion through Penny. Thanks very much.